Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Does Science. Many people who have only heard about quantum mechanics in passing have nonetheless heard about wave functions. But what is a wave function? A wave function is only one of many possible ways of looking at a quantum system. It's the so-called position representation of quantum mechanics, and it leads to the famous wave mechanics. So why are wave functions famous? Well, there are two main reasons why wave functions are famous. The first one is because many students first learned about quantum mechanics in terms of wave functions. The second one is because the language of wave functions is most useful when studying systems in 3D spatial dimensions. These include famous examples, such as potential barriers, potential wells, all the way to the hydrogen atom. In this video, we will first of all learn that wave functions are the position representation of state vectors. Second, we will derive some known results from wave mechanics, such as the scalar product between wave functions. And third, we'll relate wave functions in real space to wave functions in momentum space. Let's get started. To study wave functions, we need to start by looking at the position operator x and the momentum operator p and their commutator ih bar. This is because wave functions are intimately related with these two operators and their eigenkets. So let's start by looking at the eigenvalue equation for the position operator. x hat acting on the ket x gives us the eigenvalue x acting on the ket x. And to be clear, what I mean here by x hat is the position operator. By x I mean the position eigenvalue, which is a quantity that has units of length. And what I mean by the ket x is the ket associated with the eigenvalue x. The position operator is a Hermitian operator and therefore its eigenkets form a basis that we can choose to be orthonormal. What that means is that we can write the bracket between x and x prime as equal to the delta function at x minus x prime. Once we have defined the basis, we can expand any ket in our state space in terms of this basis. So let's do that. Let's pick a ket psi. And if we expand it in the position basis, then we write it as an integral over dx. The expansion coefficient is the bracket between x and psi. And then each of these is multiplied by the basis ket x. We are now ready to make one of the most important definitions in the whole of quantum mechanics. We define the wave function psi of x as the expansion coefficients of a ket psi in the basis formed by the eigenkets of the position operator. Wave functions are fundamental in our study of quantum mechanics and they form the formulation known as wave mechanics. My guess is that most of you will have first learned about quantum mechanics in terms of wave functions. What we can see here is that wave functions are nothing more than a special case of a representation. They are the representation of a state vector psi corresponding to the eigenkets of the position operator. So now we're able to see how wave functions fit in the more fundamental formulation of quantum mechanics in terms of state vectors and state space. We can do something very similar to what we have done for the position representation in terms of the momentum representation. So we can look at the eigenvalue equation for the momentum operator. P hat acting on the ket P is equal to the eigenvalue P acting on the ket P. As before, P hat means the momentum operator. P means the momentum eigenvalue, which has units of mass times velocity. And the ket P is the ket associated with the eigenvalue P. The eigenkets of P also form a basis, whose orthonormality condition is such that the bracket between P and P prime is equal to the delta function of P minus P prime. We can expand an arbitrary ket psi in the P representation as an integral over dP of the expansion coefficient, which is the bracket of P with psi, times the basis ket P. And we can now define the wave function in momentum space as psi bar of P as equal to the expansion coefficient, that is the projection of the ket psi on the basis p. What we have learned so far in this video are some of the most important ideas in the whole of quantum mechanics, so do make sure that you understand everything that we have discussed. To recap, we have introduced the idea of wave functions. The wave function in the position representation, psi of x, is the projection of a state vector psi onto the position representation, and the wave function in the momentum representation, psi bar of p, is similarly the projection of a ket psi onto the basis p. Now that we have introduced wave functions, we are ready to look at a number of operations in state space in terms of wave functions. And to do that, we will use the position representation wave function, psi of x. The first property I want to discuss is the scalar product between two states. So let's consider a first state psi in the position representation integral over dx bracket of x with psi x and the second state 
phi in the position representation as well, integral over dx prime bracket of x prime with phi, x prime. We can now calculate the scalar product between these two states as the bracket between psi and phi, and plugging in the expansions in the position representation, we obtain integral over dx psi xx, integral over dx prime, x prime phi x prime. Rearranging this expression, we get integral over dx, integral over dx prime, psi x, x prime phi, x x prime. We recognize psi x as the definition of the wave function star of x, x prime phi as the wave function phi of x, and x x prime as the delta function x minus x prime. The delta function makes the integral over dx prime very easy, and therefore we can write the scalar product between psi and phi as equal to the integral over dx of psi star x phi x. Those of you familiar with wave mechanics will immediately recognize this expression as the usual scalar product between two wave functions. But I want to emphasize that in our case we have derived it from more general ideas based on scalar products between kets in state space. An easy next step we can take now is to look at the normalization of a wave function. To do that, we consider the norm of a ket, which is the scalar product of a ket psi with itself, and by using the formula we have just derived, we can write this down as the integral over dx of psi star x psi of x, and then we can rewrite this as the integral over dx of the absolute value squared of psi of x. Again, this should be a formula very familiar to those of you who know wave mechanics. So far we have looked at wave functions both in the position and momentum representations. Something that is very useful when we do quantum mechanics is to be able to go from one representation to another. So what I want to do next is to look at how we can go from the position representation to the momentum representation. To do that we need to consider the overlap matrix, which in this case is the bracket between x and p, and if you need a refresher about transforming from one basis to another and about overlap matrices, take a look at the video linked in the description. Before we try to figure out what the overlap between x and p is, a word of encouragement, it is a bit tricky to get there, but we will get there, so do bear with me. The first step we need to take is to refresh our minds about the translation operator. There is a link to a full video about the translation operator in the description, but let me just quote some of the most important results that we need for calculating the overlap matrix. The translation of a position eigenket by an amount alpha is given by a translation operator t alpha, which is equal to e to the minus i alpha p over h bar. We can consider an infinitesimal translation of minus epsilon to get t of minus epsilon equals e to the i epsilon p over h bar, and we can tailor expand this exponential to obtain 1 plus i epsilon over h bar p plus a term of order epsilon squared. The action of the translation operator t alpha on a ket x is equal to another ket x plus alpha, and the corresponding expression in the dual space is such that the bra x times the operator t alpha is equal to the bra x minus alpha. Again, if these results do come as a surprise, check the video linked in the description for more details. Now that we have refreshed our mind about the translation operator, the first step we need to take to calculate the overlap between x and p is to look at the matrix element of an infinitesimal translation with respect to x and p. So let's write x t of minus epsilon p. We then use the result that we obtain here for the dual space action of the translation operator to rewrite this down as x plus epsilon p. We now copy the same matrix element x t minus epsilon p but use instead the other representation above in terms of the Taylor expansion of the translation operator to write x 1 plus i epsilon over h bar p plus a term of order epsilon squared p. Putting this together we obtain x p plus i epsilon over h bar x p hat p plus a term of order epsilon squared. One thing to note is that p hat p is simply the eigenvalue p times the ket p. Now that we have written down these two expressions for the matrix element of an infinitesimal translation, we are ready to set them equal to each other, and we can therefore rearrange that equation to obtain eigenvalue p bracket of x and p equals minus i h bar, and then we take the limit of epsilon going to zero of the rest of the terms that depend on epsilon, so we get the bracket of x plus epsilon p minus the bracket of x with p over epsilon. The limit we have written down is the definition of a derivative, and therefore we can write this whole expression as equal to minus i h bar, 
the derivative with respect to x of the bracket of x and p. Looking at the left and at the right hand side of this equation, we see that we now have a first order differential equation for the bracket between x and p that we need in our quest to transform from the position to the momentum representations. We can solve this first order differential equation by separation of variables, so we write d bracket of x with p over bracket of x with p equals i over h bar p dx. We integrate both sides to obtain the logarithm of the bracket between x and p equals i over h bar p x plus an integration constant c, and then we can exponentiate both sides of the equation to obtain that the bracket between x and p is equal to n e to the i p x over h bar. The n in this expression is simply the transformation of the integration constant c when we exponentiated both sides of the equation. After quite a few steps, we have finally reached the conclusion that the overlap matrix between x and p is proportional to e to the i px over h bar, and all we have left to do now is to determine the proportionality constant n. Let's start with a fresh page, and we write down the final result we obtained, which is that the bracket between x and p is equal to n times e to the i px over h bar. To find the constant n, we'll start by looking at the orthonormality condition in the x representation, the bracket of x with x prime is equal to the delta function of x minus x prime, and then we're going to rewrite this bracket in the following manner. x1 x prime equals x, now we insert the resolution of the identity in the p representation, so we write integral over dp of pp x prime, and operating through this gives us the integral over dp of xp p x prime. The two terms under the integral sign are simply equal to the term above and its complex conjugate, and we can therefore write the whole thing as equal to absolute value squared of n integral over dp of e to the i p x minus x prime over h bar. At this point we must use one of the many definitions of the delta function, which tells us that delta function of x minus x prime is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral over du of e to the i u x minus x prime. And looking at our expression, we see that we have exactly this under the integral sign. If we make the substitution, u equals p over h bar. We can therefore evaluate the integral we have to obtain n squared 2 pi h bar delta function of x minus x prime. This term we just obtained must be equal to the delta function above, because both of them are equal to the bracket between x and x prime. We can therefore set them equal to each other, and we obtain that the absolute value squared of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi h bar, which in turn tells us that n is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar. Putting everything together, we finally can write the expression for the overlap matrix between x and p, which is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar times e to the i p x over h bar. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, it would take us a while to get here, but finally we have determined the transformation matrix, xp, that allows us to go between the position representation and the momentum representation. So let's finish the job, and let's write psi bar of p equals the projection of psi on p, which is equal to p1 psi, which is equal to p, then we insert the resolution of the identity in terms of x, which is integral of dx, xx psi, and then we re-express this whole thing as integral over dx px x psi. We can now collect the fruit of our labor, and we identify the px term as simply the conjugate of the xp term above. We also identify x psi as simply the wave function psi of x, and we can therefore write the whole thing as 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar integral over dx e to the minus i px over h bar psi of x. You should repeat the same exercise for the converse transformation, but I'm just going to write down the result, which is that the wave function psi of x, which is equal to the bracket between x and psi, is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar integral over dp of e to the i p x over h bar psi bar p. We are finally done, and we can say now that in order to go from the wave function in the position representation to the wave function in the momentum representation, or vice versa, all we have to do is we have to calculate the corresponding Fourier transforms. This is another general result that will be familiar to those of you who know about wave mechanics, and again we have reached this result by using the more fundamental formalism of state space and state vectors.
Before we conclude, I very quickly want to generalize the results we have obtained in one dimension in terms of x and p to three dimensions in terms of the vectors r and p. In three dimensions, the position operator r is a vector operator made of three components, which are x1, x2, and x3, or equivalently, x, y, z. Similarly, the momentum operator is also a vector operator p, and again it has three components, p1, p2, and p3, or also px, py, pz. Putting these together, we find the canonical commutation relations between these vector operators as xj pk equals ih bar delta jk. We can now start looking at all the results we have derived in one dimension. So the eigenvalue equation for the position operator is the operator r acting on the ket r, which gives you the eigenvalue r acting on the ket r, the eigenkets form a basis which is orthonormal, so the bracket between r and r prime is equal to the delta function of r minus r prime, and we can expand an arbitrary ket psi in terms of the position basis as the integral over dr psi of r r, where psi of r is the three-dimensional wave function which is given by the projection of the state psi on the basis function r. It works in exactly the same way for the momentum operator, so p hat acting on the ket p is equal to the eigenvalue p acting on the ket p. The orthonormality relation reads bracket p p prime equals delta function of p minus p prime. We can expand the state psi in the p basis as integral over dp psi bar of p p, and psi bar of p is the three-dimensional momentum wave function which is given by the bracket between p and psi. Just like in one dimension, we can relate the position and momentum wave functions through the Fourier transform, psi of r is equal to 1 over 2 pi h bar to the power of 3 halves integral over dp e to the i p dot r over h bar psi bar of p. So let's recap what we have accomplished in this video. We have started by looking at the position operator x and the momentum operator p whose commutator is i h bar, and we have defined representations associated with the eigenkets x and p of these two operators. These two representations are very important in quantum mechanics because they lead to the formulation known as wave mechanics, which is the formulation by which most students are first introduced to the quantum world. What we have seen is how this formulation fits into the more fundamental formulation based on state space, and we have identified the wave function psi of x as the representation of a state psi in the x basis, and the momentum space wave function psi bar of p as the representation of a state psi in the momentum basis. Having defined wave functions from the fundamental state space formulation of quantum mechanics, we can then derive the usual results from wave mechanics, such as the scalar product between two states psi and phi, which is the integral over dx of psi star of x phi of x, and the normalization of a ket psi psi, which is equal to the integral over dx of the absolute value squared of psi of x. We have also been able to relate the position representation to the momentum representation, and we have found that the wave function psi of x is related to the momentum space wave function psi bar of p through an integral over a plane wave e to the i p x over h bar, which tells us that the momentum and position wave functions are related to each other via a Fourier transform. In this video, we have learned that wave functions are simply a particular representation of state vectors, and we have seen how they fit in the wider formalism of quantum mechanics. So what next? Wave functions are extremely useful in studying problems in 3D spatial dimensions, so we can now learn about things like quantum tunneling of particles all the way to the hydrogen atom. If you like this video, or if you'd like to send me suggestions for future videos, subscribe.